So now here comes the final sessions with Tim. Oh, you know, Tim just uh, Tim runs the physical notes. They just recently listed on uh, Nasdaq. So now later on, he will he will share uh, the startup experience and their roadmap for the ESG and climate change. That's welcome. Hello, everyone, uh, and welcome uh, to the fireside chat at Spark Labs Taipei Demo Day. Uh, and we're very, very excited today to have Tim Wang, who is the CEO, co-founder, and chairman of Fiscal Note, which just went IPO uh, about three weeks ago on the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, and we're here to hear Tim's journey from uh, how he started, fresh out of college, all the way to becoming the youngest Asian American CEO on the on the stock exchange. So uh, welcome, Tim. Yeah, great to be on. Thank you. And uh, well, we, we're just gonna we're gonna hear the story of your journey and all the challenges, the challenges, the opportunities that um, along the way, and then the opportunities that face fiscal note in the future. So let's go back to to IPO day. You know, tell us what that was like. Your, your parents were there. Everyone was there. It was uh, it was a magical day. Great weather too. Yeah, no, for, uh, you know, we started off really early in the morning, actually, I think uh, something like, you know, 630 in the morning, uh, you know, a bunch of our, our early employees and our executives and some of our customers and investors were all, you know, out in attendance. And, you know, it was really, um, I think that, uh, you know, when you're uh, preparing a company to go public, uh, you know, for, you know, a year, two years, three years in advance, um, you know, it's it's become like this long journey, right? I mean, you just you know every single day talking to investment bankers and lawyers and, and whatnot, and at the same time still running the company. Um, and then I think that you know uh, when people sort of ask me like, oh, what do you what do you how do you feel about you know going public and the like? Um, you know, I would generally say you know it's just been a really long process. It's just really tiring. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, it, that morning I think as we were walking um, the very iconic. Uh, you know, New York Stock Exchange on literally on Wall Street, um, and then looking up and seeing this gigantic banner with the company logo behind it and, and our ticker, you know, kind of right across the, the stock ticker. I think, you know, that's that was um, a really exciting moment because, you know, to be totally candid, as you mentioned before, um, you know, we, we've been working on this company for you know seven or eight years, um, you know, pretty much straight out of college, and uh, to kind of see that experience um, all the way from literally an idea. Um, you know, with three guys, an idea uh, and a laptop, um, and then watching it literally step by step by step by step, um, you know, employee by employee, investment round by investment round, product launch by product launch, um, you know, new geography by new geography. You know, we just basically systematically, you know, kind of built out this company, you know, to where it is today. And, you know, um, uh, you know, having all of our, you know, kind of all the people that made it a, a real success for us, I think, um, you know, it was a real a uh, very special moment for for the organization. Yeah, definitely. And I think, you know, it was the your drive, determination and and tenacity that really got it to to where it is today. Um it's very hard to get a company to to an IPO and in 7 and 8 years, which is pretty fast. Um you know, what was what do you think was the key that that got you there? What was the what were the couple of key things that that propelled Fiscal Note onto the onto the, as to an IPO? Uh, I think that the first thing is probably our very strong sense of mission. Um, and you know, I was looking at our business plan that we wrote actually back in 2013. And um, you know, what's really interesting and special about Fiscal Note is that we've never pivoted the company, not once. Um, the product that we wanted to create in 2013. It's still the product that we sell today. The market that we wanted to, you know, sell to in 2013 is still the market today. Um, and I think that, you know, for us, it started off with this very strong sense of mission. Um, you know, we exist uh, to make sense of the complicated uh, political and regulatory and government-oriented actions that sort of exist out there in the world. And so, um, you know, the, in the context of sort of um, trying to build a company, the number one thing basically was, why does this company exist? This company exists because we want to solve this particular problem. Um, and from that kernel of that mission, you know, we were able to recruit our first employees, um, you know, raise uh, institutional capital, um, really solve problems for our customers, um, you know, scale through the business, through all the different ups and downs and different challenges. Um, 
And I think, you know, uh, when a lot of startup founders, they kind of build their companies, they, um, they kind of focus really heavy on the business stuff and they focus on the business model and the financial plans and all those things, which are very important, uh, no doubt. But the intangible aspects of, um, of saying, I'm going to devote my life to the next, uh, you know, the next 10 years of my life to this particular mission and solving this problem, um, that sort of maniacal, you know, focus on that mission, I think is something that, you know, was very special to the business. Um, I think a derivative of that is probably um, the people that we hired. Um, you know, we have an excellent, excellent management team. Um, I would say they're they're pretty much world class. Um, you know, they have uh, even today. You know, for many of them, this is their you know second or third or fourth rodeo. You know, scaling companies from you know hundred million in sales to a billion in sales or so. And even before that, you know, um, the passion and the um, audacity and the um, the tenacity of the team, particularly in the early stage, um, was uh, almost unbeatable. I mean, I, 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 I said this to our early employees. It may sound rough, um, but um, uh, I basically said, you know, when we first started the company, that um, you know, what what are the kind of work expectations? Well, the work expectations are you basically work um, as a team together in this tiny little room in our first office. We're going to work seven days a week, and I expect you to be in the office at nine in the morning, um, you know, every single day. Um, and you know, if if that's not an environment um, that uh, that you can be a part of, then I think that's that's particularly that's it's, you don't have to be here. You can join us later in the company or whatnot. But um, I do remember uh, it wasn't just you know sort of like blind luck, right? I mean, we we put in a lot of effort, um, you know, uh, and I'm you know I'm sure we'll go into some of the stories, but. You know, when we were pitching investors, when we were call, you know, calling our customers, when we were building our product, I basically literally put a, uh, a number on a whiteboard and I said, here's how much cash we have. Um, you know, and every single day we, we you know, put that number down a little bit lower. Um, and you know, I'd open up a Google spreadsheet. You know, we basically populated it with hundreds and hundreds of customer prospects. And then I literally got these like burner phones <laughs> from the convenience store. And we were just cold calling customers and, you know, for endless hours every single day, right? So it wasn't, uh, it really was like a huge amount of effort to basically, you know, try and get this company off the ground. And that's what it comes back to. I mean, it's every single story, whether it's you or Travis at Uber, uh, it's exactly the same. It's, it's you got to hustle. You have to get down and work so hard to get to where you need to get to. Um, and, uh, you know, every single story is going to be like that. You know, it's, it's just, it's just, if you want to build a big global business, you have to, you have to work hard to get there. Um, we're going to go through lots of stories, but I, I want you to go back to, you know, just coming straight out of college. You've like a lot of the people in the audience today, uh, you know, they're very, you know, just out of university, um, starting companies, being involved in companies, you know, um, just tell us the story. Like, how did you? You know, you went off to Motel 6 and, um, and got a room and, and didn't leave the room for a very long time. So, uh, you know, just tell us the story a little bit. Yeah, yeah. So my, my co-founders and I, um, you know, we, we didn't come from wealthy families. You know, we were just very, very, you know, middle class. Um, you know, I grew up, we went to public school. Um, you know, we kind of had known each other since elementary, middle school and high school. And I preface that by saying, um, you know, we... Did, we didn't, when we went to Silicon Valley, we, well, first of all, we basically pulled all of our kind of summer internship savings and summer jobs and the like into kind of this maybe a couple thousand dollars and we bought a one-way ticket to San Francisco. Um, and uh, we had zero, absolutely zero connections to the tech industry or Silicon Valley. I mean, we didn't know a single person. Um, I think we tried uh, rooming with someone on Craigslist or something because we just didn't, we, I, didn't have, I didn't have any friends in San Francisco. Um, so, uh, you know, we tried to find an apartment and this is our first apartment, you know, that we were trying to get as adults. We were maybe 21 years old at the time. And, you know, we were just so, so shocked at how expensive it was. Um, and we didn't know that yet to get a, a, a year long lease for an apartment. So we were trying to find months and months stuff. Um, and it was just so exorbitantly expensive. So um, we, you know, booked a Motel 6 room. It's like a very, very, you know, like one star, low budget uh, motel. It's like radi basically like right above a Burger King. Um, and, you know, <laughs> uh, we, you know, I think we, we were paying something like, you know, 50 or $60 a night. Um, and it was actually cheaper than an apartment. So uh, we stayed there for, you know, several months. I mean, that's where we were working at a bar um, to try and build this company. Um, you know, we, we basically up until 
and maybe five people or so, we had these like two twin beds in the Motel 6 room, you know, two people sleeping on each bed and then one person sleeping on the floor. And it would take like three hours every morning to take a shower because everyone would be kind of recycling through the bathroom. But um, yeah, I mean, we, we, um, we put in a lot of effort, you know, back then. I mean, we would get up in the morning, um, you know, we'd like go down to Burger King or whatever, walk around. And then, you know, it was like maybe eight or nine in the morning. We just keep working, like coding, calling customers, building marketing decks. Um, and we do that every single day until like, you know, one or two in the morning and we just go back to sleep until we pass out and then we just do it again, seven days a week. Um, do those guys all six guys ever wonder what was going on? <laughs> I, I That I don't know. I mean, we there's just you know, a, bunch of, there's a bunch of kids upstairs, you know, just coding, right? <laughs> Ace of Silicon Valley. Um, but yeah, I mean, that that was, you know, um, almost, you know, eight, eight or nine years ago. And um, actually, Tim, I want to stop you there because I, I, this is a really, really key point. Because so many people from, a, from Asia and Taiwan, right, they see everybody in the US knows everybody, right? So they think that everybody knows everybody in Silicon Valley. So like, like you know, I, I, I go across this, I mean, they think that US founders have this enormous advantage because they know everybody right that's absolutely not the case you guys were out of the east coast coming across to silicon valley not knowing anyone and you had to hustle exactly the same as any you know founder coming out of taiwan they have to get across and do exactly the same thing yeah no so yeah that's that's a great point so you know i mean literally i'm not even kidding we um we went online on Google and we literally looked up networking events and we typed in Silicon Valley networking events and we'd show up to these like very dinky, you know, back of the bar, like happy hour type networking events, um, you know, where there'd be like 20 or 30 people mingling and talking about startups. And that's, you know, we'd, we'd go, th go out there with our business cards and try and meet everybody. And so, um, I mean, we, uh, yeah, it was, it was definitely a lot of hustle, a lot of effort, but, um, you know, eventually we built a network and, you know, start to meet investors and other corporate partners and customers, uh, other employees. Uh, but you know, it was basically starting from, almost completely from scratch. And hey, what does it feel like? So, so you've got to, and, and I think the part about the mission, and it, today fiscal notes mission is exactly the same. And it's actually become much more important. Policy and regulation and, and legislation has become central to corporates where it wasn't maybe so much seven, eight years ago. It's now everything across all industries. Um, and I think that sense of mission is driving fiscal note forward in the future as well. I mean, that's you've got that base because you've got the experience, the team that's built around that, right? Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. And and I think again, um, I mean, of course, you know, we, we care a lot about financial discipline and operational discipline and efficiency and you know all the things that you need to have when you're running a an any any business or organization. But I I think that what makes fiscal note really special from the very beginning, again, you know, was that sense of mission. And I tell this to our employees all the time that um, there are many, 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 many ways to um, make money. Um, there's many, many, many ways to start a business and, and multiple different industries you can go into. Um, you know, but as far as B2B technology companies go, fiscal note, you know, we're not just selling a random marketing data analytics software, right? You know, that helps like Coca-Cola become more efficient. You know, that's not, that's not what we do. Our, the business that we're in is fundamentally helping governments and other organizations understand politics, um, what their obligations are to the society, what their obligations are to each other, um, you know, to their governments, um, you know, that conducts global diplomacy, you know, engages in warfare, uh, engages in uh, corporate foreign direct investment. And, the importance of those decisions is so important that I think um, that that sense of mission should drive every single person to, you know, put in a, a, a tremendous amount of effort because they know that they're making a huge difference in the world. And I, I think one of the other things that is also from a sense of mission is just that story about you writing in a circle the the amount of cash left over on the whiteboard. There is a sense of fiscal discipline that still goes through fiscal note today. Uh, you know, as we're as we're moving forward, and I think that that sense of fiscal focus and discipline helps a lot across an organisation because you all know what you're joining for, right? You either, you know, um, and the the way that you're going to get there is is through a, is a smart, you know, focused way of of um, of getting what we need to get to. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I, it's it's obviously even more important now that we're publicly traded, and um, you know, we put out. Uh, sales guidance and profitability targets and, and things like that. So all the, all the, the fun things about running a business, you know, we are we are definitely on top of all of that. But you know, it's 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 um, 
it's it's all the package together, right? Of of like what business yes. are you in and how do you do it and and the approaches and ethics that you sort of take to get there. Yeah, and um, so going back to uh, going back to the the days of growth as you were, as you're going forward, um, you know, one of the questions that you know founders, as we all know, um, sometimes can feel slightly overwhelmed by everything that's hitting them. It could be a some sort of incident or, or some sort of world changing thing or suddenly there's you know there's a recession hitting or whatever there is right you know have you ever felt that sense of kind of being overwhelmed and how do you deal with it like how do you step take a step back and think right what's the path forward here what are the decisions i need to make yeah yeah no it's it's a good question i mean particularly for early stage founders so i remember when i was a you know seed stage founder pre-seed stage founder series a founder series b founder the world is extremely overwhelming. I mean, it's like there's so many things you have to do. You have to build the product and refine it. You have to talk to customers and you have to keep getting their feedback. You have to generate sales. On top of that, you got to write, you know, investor relations reports. You know, then you got to do um, board meetings and then you know put together marketing collateral and you know keep recruiting. I mean, there's like a lot of things you have to do. So, um, I think that you know, in the early early days. Um, this is what I, t- I would tell our early employees and our executives. This is like when we were maybe, you know, 15, 20, 30 people. Um, I would tell them, you know, if you feel overwhelmed, you know, literally sit down, you know, close your eyes, take a step back um, and, you know, take out a blank sheet of paper and write it one to 10 and, you know, write out the exact things you need to do in the next 24 hours. And I need you to basically sit down and cross it out one by one. Um, because ultimately in a startup, if you don't do it, then the company doesn't do it. So, um, if you don't put to, put together the marketing material and you're and you're the only marketing person, then the company doesn't have marketing materials. You know, so um, I think what that does is basically it forces you to prioritize the things that need to get done immediately and are the most important, and then you basically cross things out. You know, just pure play execution style, and you don't get out of your desk until you finish all ten things, um, and. That level of focus, I think, is really important uh, because there's so many things you could be doing. And, I, and I've, I've definitely been um, uh, uh, subject to this as well, where, uh, you know, you kind of run around, you know, like doing a lot of things and taking meetings and, and calling people and the like. But when you take a step back and look at like the actual things that you've done for that day, it actually hasn't moved the needle at all. Like you're just basically acting busy. So um I think that you have to avoid those types of things and you basically have to focus on the things that matter, which in an early stage company, it's basically three things. It's you have to build the product, get it to customers and you have to recruit a great team. There's literally almost nothing else that matters. Um, and I think that, um, you know, if you just stay laser focused on those three things, then, uh, you know, generally, you know, the outcome should be pretty good. That's great. Thanks. Thanks, Tim. That's fantastic advice. And, um, I, one other thing that I think is really critical along Fiscal Nerd's journey is that you didn't pivot. Um, and I think a lot of company, a lot of founders will think, oh my God, I've got to like pivot and then competition's coming or I've, they've seen something else. But and, and someone, they read some story about some company that pivoted and was very successful. I think that most people forget that if there was a pivot, it was an extremely early stage in that company's uh, growth. It would have been like when four or five people suddenly decided that they might want to change and go direction. But once you once you start to grow, you really don't. And um, uh, because you're delivering a mission and you've just got to scale it and you, you're obviously getting on the growth side of it. You know, what's the, that that was a very important point. How do you say to founders, like, how do you sort of like shut out the noise of everything that's going on, competitors, et cetera, but obviously still stay looking at what they're doing, but keep keep focused at the same time. It's very difficult as a founder to do that, I think. Yeah, well, you know, there's that quote that, uh, Jeff Bezos gave about um, you know how how you think about competitors, which is that you know your competitors don't pay your bills, your customers do, and so there's no reason why you should be paying attention to them. <laughs> um, so you know I think that it always comes from kind of a customer focused mindset, and for us, I think it was really you know I think of course we monitor what competitors are doing, but not in the sense of like oh you know they're doing this, so we should do that. It's more more like oh you know I wonder if they're thing that customers really like, um, then, you know, maybe we should incorporate that into our roadmap or something, but it's never just pure, purely about the competition or even about the market. You know, I, I spent a lot of time as an early stage founder, like kind of clicking through TechCrunch and, um, you know, looking at funding announcements and things like that, but it wasn't, um, most of it's just pretty much noise to be honest. And, you know, it's not like 
there's a tremendous um, you know difference it's going to make you know in your particular company you know to know about those things. And so, from a focus perspective, I think again it just comes down to can you de deliver a product? Um, can you uh, effectively get to a point where you know uh, you started to build a, a revenue generation machine, um, and then can you really build a great team around it to support it? And um, those are really the only ways you can sort of um, control the outcomes of of a particular startup. Thanks, Tim. And uh, great, great advice. And one of the things I was going to say, so one of the key areas that Fiscal Note is focused on is ESG and climate. And um, obviously, you know, when we at Equilibrium um, became a Taiwanese company, uh, became part of Fiscal Note, it was, a, it was a great part of that journey. And we have, you know, a great team in, in Taiwan that are working on um, ESG and climate. And at the same time, you're in Korea at the moment, and you know a large amount of your time is now focused on on Asia of expansion in Asia. You know what do you see as the opportunities in ESG climate, and then we'll we'll come to Asia in general um, for fiscal note. So you know broadly speaking about fiscal note strategy. Um, so we we spent the last several years building this company. Um, now this company basically collects laws and regulations and government documents from. Uh, multiple gov you know, governments around the world, and then basically helps companies or organizations understand how those laws potentially impact um, their industries and their companies. So um, the first question that we solve for our customers fundamentally is what's going on, right? So what's going on in the world and how does it impact me? And now I think what Fiscal Note is doing is we're trying to pivot into the second question, which is thank you, Fiscal Note, for telling me what's going on. Now what should I do about it? How do I respond to this? Um, and in that second question, um, what do I do about it? How do I respond? Um, what is my response? Um, we are building a series of businesses um, that effectively um, help to answer that second question. One of the biggest trends from a regulatory perspective globally in almost every single country around the world right now is there is a fundamental race um, you know, to effectively save the planet um, you know, from an environmental perspective. You know, and more collectively, Build better companies uh, and uh, kind of corporate institutions, um, you know, in response to that, uh, more ethical, uh, more environmentally friendly, um, uh, so on and so forth, more stakeholder uh, oriented, um, and I think that you know that general movement um, is something that we uh, are trying to kind of take advantage of, of course, on corp from a corporate perspective. And so, um, Equilibrium, of course. Um, as a effectively kind of a, a data collection and, and ESG monitoring and kind of dashboard type tool uh, that we sell to a lot of customers around the world. Um, and, you know, our hope is that, you know, we are effectively doubling down um, on, uh, you know, that second question and asking ourselves, um, what more can we do to help organizations make that transition, you know, to a more sustainable future? Um, and in that, um, Many, many companies have not built the foundations of ESG uh, management. Um, you know, they see these regulations on the fiscal platforms uh, from securities regulators, from environmental regulators and, and others, uh, from legislatures and, and, and the like. And they're saying, OK, you have to focus on this. So the companies turn around and they say, oh, well, what, how do I do that? <laughs> um, well, first of all, I need to collect information about, you know, my carbon emissions, for instance, right? More, you know, uh, greenhouse gases, whatever it is. And we have to essentially help our uh, our customers aggregate that information, and then we have to you know allow them to do things like benchmarking um, or other workflow tools um, that essentially help them to manage that you know throughout the next couple of years as regulators continue to kind of press forward. And so um, it's a direct extension of our mission, um, and it's something that we are you know obviously very excited about as we make those continued investments. And that's what I love working at Fiscal Note about, which is the ability across many, many different sectors, and uh, ESG climate being one of the most crucial ones, to have a to get a company help them with their understanding of their data, a data driven understanding of their sector, like ESG climate, or whether it's other sectors, um, and then you know how what do you do about it? Like how do you make the difference, and how do you understand what are the policy and regulations that are going to affect your business, and how do you make a change? So it's not like I think so many companies might either just do the data understanding or the consultancy piece, but there are very very few that can bring all of that together and and give you like okay, let's give you a data driven understanding, a deep data driven understanding 
and then through policy and regulation support and then understand what are you going to do about it and how are you going to make the changes in your organization that are going to make you effective in the market and win the market. That's what I, I like that the way that you apply that model again and again in different sectors. Um, and, um, you know, what's your, you know, what's, what are you, what are your, what's Fiscal Notes plans for Asia in general at the moment? We, we are expanding very heavily in Asia. Um, you know, Frank, as you mentioned, we made a number of acquisitions in Asia in the last 12 months. Um, we bought uh, ISIL Technologies, which is a alternative data uh, market uh, uh, data company uh, here in South Korea. Uh, we bought, you know, Equilibrium, uh, you know, in Taiwan, uh, about Timebase um, in, uh, in Australia. Um, and so we are making pretty significant investments, you know, into the Asian market. Um, and it's just the reality of, I think, you know, kind of where we are as a business, um, you know, as fiscal note kind of crosses the, um, the threshold of, uh, you know, hundred million in sales, 200 million in sales, 500 million in sales, you know, billion dollars in sales. Um, the ironic thing is a lot of people think that, um, you know, uh, once you become a big company, you sort of, or bigger company, you know, uh, things change and they do, they, they, they do change quite a bit, but, um, the way I view kind of our next stages, um, is we need to continuously build, um, startups within this bigger startup. Um, and you know, the way that we're going to effectively make fiscal note 10 times bigger as an organization is by cultivating, reinvesting, driving product innovation, driving customer growth and, and the like. And so you sort of take a, a map out of the world and you sort of look at, okay, where, where, where are we heavily concentrated? Where can we grow? Um, you know, we obviously started off in the U S we made a number of investments and growth opportunities in the European market. Um, and you know, those continue to kind of grow fairly nicely. Um, and then now we're actually now entering into the Asia market here, um, as we try and figure out, uh, product innovation, uh, customer growth opportunities, um, you know, joint venture opportunities, whatever the case is. And so, um, it's something that, uh, you know, I, uh, I, I spend a lot of time thinking about, um, as you think about sort of, you know, the next phases of, of growth in the future for the next, you know, three, five, seven years or so. Yep. Uh, and then that, that's, uh, and, and there is a, a, a very, very good sense of, um, entrepreneurship and innovation inside fiscal mate, but, but controlled and, uh, and, and managed, uh, which is, uh, which is a great combination. Um, and so just we're just going to wrap it up, Tim. And uh, look, you've got the, the audience in, in, in front of you here and uh, uh, everyone, so many founders and, and, and people in startups in the audience and, and wanting to be where you are. Um, you know, what's the sort of a, what's the last you know, key piece of advice that you would, would give them um, as they're, as they're re- in, embarking on their journey at the moment? You know, I think that... Um doing a startup is not a job. Um, it is a lifestyle. And, um, you know, there's, there's a pretty big difference between, you know, where you work and then how you live. Um, and, you know, startups are an all consuming obsession. Um, I was, uh, talking to, uh, another founder friend of mine the other day, and we were remarking that, um, you know, there's a couple thousand, uh, U.S. Olympic athletes that go, you know, to the Olympics, you know, every two or four years or so. Um, and, but in the U.S., there's only actually about, you know, six or 700 unicorn CEOs. Um, and so think about the image of an Olympic athlete, like the lifestyle that they live, getting up in the morning every single day, you know, three, four in the morning, going, going to the gym, whatever it is, um, training and training and training and training to try and get to the Olympics, you know, to qualify. Um, now take that level of discipline and then multiply it because it's even harder to be a unicorn CEO than it is to be an Olympic athlete. Um, and so, uh, the level of, you know, emotional, psychological, physical kind of discipline that you need to basically have, um, to basically keep driving, keep driving, keep driving, uh, keep pushing the team and bringing everyone along and bringing, you know, it's like this gigantic circus and it starts with, you know, one or two or three people as co-founders, you've got to basically build, the entirety of the product version, the entirety of the customers, um, you know, you have to bring all these investors along, you have to bring all these partners along. Um, and you're basically playing the flute as everybody kind of walks down the, uh, the road. Right. So, um, if you are not personally obsessed with the company, um, then how do you expect other people to be obsessed with you? (laughs) So I think that, um, you know, as, as, uh, cliche as it sounds, um, 
you know, startups are a lot of work. They're a tremendous amount of work. Um, and, you know, the, the co-founders have to sort of stand at the front of the line, you know, kind of leading the charge. Um, I think that, um, you know, looking back on my kind of startup career, uh, it was really hard. Um, you know, there, there are definitely times when I thought the company was going to fail, uh, probably multiple times I thought the company was going to fail. Um, and, you know, you just kind of have to basically like sit down and center yourself and, and just ch chart a pathway forward. Um, and that like sheer determination and tenacity, in my experience, um, you know, when I interact with, you know, a lot of late stage founders or, um, you know, company or other CEOs that have taken the companies public, they are tenacious. They're very aggressive. Um, they will literally bust through walls to basically get things done. Any obstacle you put in front of them, they're just going to, uh, in a very quick fashion, try and work a way around it. And um, that's what it takes to basically get to the end and uh, or, the, or the beginning of the end, I guess, you know, for us. <laughs> um, but that's what it takes to basically build a, a larger business. And, and I think that's, um, you know, if you can internalize that, focus on customers, build the product, you know, um, and, you know, recruit the right teams, then it's actually not a tremendous, it's not rocket science, you know, to, to kind of build something, you know, that I think is meaningful. So, you know, yeah, I guess have fun, uh, but just remember that, that it is a very, very uh, um, particular lifestyle for sure. Uh, well, with that, Tim, I mean, that's fantastic advice, fantastic advice. I mean, it just, it, it is completely like being an athlete of a different kind, but just even even smaller opportunities at the end of the day. So thank you, Tim. Listen, this has been great. Thank you very much for taking your time uh, to share your thoughts and vision for the audience today. Much, much appreciated. And um, thank you. And we're we're looking forward to growing Fiscal Note in in Taiwan and uh, looking forward to seeing the opportunities that we can provide to everybody in Taiwan, particularly around ESG and climate and, and far more than that to, um, to everyone here. So thanks again, Tim. Much appreciated. Yeah, absolutely. Great to be on.